Hi folks, Scott Sega with you here again, RTC TV4. We've got the political interviews happening for you the entire month of October, and today we brought in a new candidate. This is Greg Heller. Greg's been in our studios before as he was in the primary this spring, and we brought him back. Greg is running for Superior Court Judge here in Fulton County. Greg, it's welcome. Good to have you back, my good friend. Good to see you. Had a what, good talk in the spring, we so it's did. good to be back I, now. I know a lot of our viewers saw that, and uh, that's what we want. We want you to have that opportunity to talk to the folks out there and uh, introduce yourself a little bit. Yeah. So they enjoyed that. Well, it's been a few months. You've been doing other things, I know. You've been talking about some seminars and some uh, things you've been going to around the state. But let's just kind of jump right in at the beginning. Uh, Greg Heller, where are you from? How long have you lived here? Talk about your family. I know you're proud of those girls. So. Absolutely. Well, for those who don't know me, um, I've been married to my wife, Trina, for 32 years. 32 years. And we have two daughters, Corinne and Kelsey. Yeah. They're 26 and 24, and I think I failed to mention their names last time, yep. so yep. I heard about that. So, <laughs> Corinne and Kelsey, 26 and 24. Um, we've been here, or at least I've been practicing here for 20 years okay. in Rochester. Wow. Uh, when I came out of law school, I started my private a private practice here, and... I actually moved my family here 18 years ago. Okay. So, but bottom line, the girls have gone through their elementary school, yeah. their middle school, their high school. Here. They were proud zebras, and we were proud they were to proud have them. Proud zebras, <laughs> yeah. I always say that you know the, the thundering herd, you know, the, and they always thought the mascot was kind of timid. I said, "You've not seen a thundering herd." <laughs> a thundering of herd of zebras can do a lot, my friend. <laughs> exactly. I like that. So. Yeah, we've been here for 18 years. Like I said, I've had my private practice for 20 years. Excellent. So, and I think I mentioned the last time that we talked, and my mom even moved here about 10 years oh, ago. Oh, that's right. Yes. I was born and raised in Fort Wayne, yeah. Indiana, and then after my dad passed away in 2000, a few years after that, uh, my mom moved here. Nice. So very nice. So yeah, we're pretty vested in the community now. Absolutely are. Well, um, as with most, I'm assuming, um, small town rural attorneys, you've seen a menagerie of different types of law in yes, your 18 have. to 20 years here, right? I do. And I, you know, I liken it to being a 21st century Atticus Finch. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> um, because it is a small town general practice. Yes, sir. And so what that means is that you're not specializing in any one yeah. practice area. Large law firms have departments for that, mm -hmm. but when you're in a small town practice, you are trying to service clients with the problems they have. So you're dealing with real people with mm -hmm. real problems. So we do, we have done all sorts of the civil litigation sure. from the contract disputes to the property line disputes. Mm -hmm. uh, that also includes family law and mm -hmm. all the components of that because then you have divorce, custody, visitation issues, support yeah. issues. Um, guardianships, adoptions, uh, and then there's a large, uh, unfortunately, a large practice area within the in criminal law. Yes. We've done that both on the uh, my private practice level and also as a public defender. Okay. Um, and I keep a full caseload of, of appointed public defender uh, criminal cases. And then I've been fortunate uh, in my practice is that I've done a, uh, had the opportunity to serve a lot of government entities. Oh, okay. Um, and that's been, it's been very f rewarding in a lot of ways because that keeps you really tied in to issues that are involved oh, in the community. Absolutely. So I served like, uh, currently I serve as the Fulton County attorney, okay. also attorney for the, for the county council, um, also for the plan commission, the board of zoning appeals, yeah. serve as legal counsel for the, for the Fulton County library. And in the past, I've served as a you know, town attorney for Akron, for wow. Kiwana, okay. um, even the city of Rochester. Like I said, the, the nice thing about that practice area, you are aware of the oh, different yeah. issues that are coming up. Quite informed, aren't you? Absolutely. <laughs> well, this year, you know, we had in the spring, you know, the wind farm issue. Yep. Uh, very involved in that. And more recently, you know, we have the jail issue. Yep. Uh, very informed of that. And so. And these have major implications on the taxpayers. Absolutely, they do. Um, so you've got the boards doing their due diligence, but you're behind them making sure that they're on the legal exactly side of the right. equation. Exactly right. I always, I always say that my role as a, as a representing a government entity is to let the board or the entity know whether what they're doing is legal. Mm hmm. And then whether they do it or not, 
That's their decision. Right. Because they're the elected officials. They're yeah. the policy makers. You're there to counsel and advise. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but I tell you, I've, I've seen in other counties, I mean, like a county attorney, get more involved in the decision making really? than I think is, yeah. than should be. There's a line, and I'm sure there's some temptation out there to be a little bit more of a, put your take on it rather than just give them the black and white. Absolutely mm -hmm. right. And I think that's a mistake. I, I, because I would I agree. Think, you know, the, you know, if, as an attorney and as a judge, mm -hmm. I mean, people look at those positions, mm -hmm. and and so if you're serving in that capacity, you could easily cross over that line and trying to sure. sway decisions, sure. as, and you need to be careful of that. Yeah, you and I talked a little off camera beforehand about um, judge positions, whether they should be appointed or elected, and the difficulties. There's pros and cons to both sides. And Absolutely. It's a difficult thing. School board members, you know, it's, you know, are you a Democrat or a Republican? Mm -hmm. Where does that come into play in the decisions you're making for my child? And it, it's just part of the system and you have to go through it. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm not a politician, right. but it is an elected position yeah. and it's a partisan elected sure. position. I'm the Republican candidate. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I've been doing a lot of campaigning. I've learned a lot, mm -hmm. and I certainly have learned that what my mom always talked about, that you could be president, and I always said, no, mom, I don't want to be president. I know I don't want to be president. <laughs> <And> I <laughs> absolutely don't want that. We could all take that microscope on us every day, <laughs> but uh, difficulties. But Superior Court judge, let's talk about, um, and I know we went through some of this in the spring, and, and hopefully you're taking notes again and keeping up, but we have two levels of courts, if you will, mm -hmm. in Fulton County. Yes. One is the Superior Court, the other is the Circuit Court, is yes. that correct? Yep. And they handle different case loads based on how the county has decided they'll be parsed out? In large part, that's true. Okay. I mean, we have, every county has a Circuit Court. Okay. And that is actually, those were created by our Indiana State Constitution. That's in the Constitution. And a lot of people don't realize we we have a constitution. Every state yeah, has of a course. constitution. Ours is very similar to the federal We model. should do a constitutional law show just on I, showing what's really in there. I abs <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, because I do have my legal program on WROI yeah. the last Friday of every month, and I've done yeah. that for about 10 years. Yep. We actually did do a program See? on that because I didn't realize that until I went to law school <laughs> that we had a state constitution. Yeah. So yeah. it is interesting. But our circuit courts... Every county has one that was created by the Indiana State Constitution. Mm -hmm. And then, as the population of the state grew, mm -hmm. well, we needed more courts. Mm -hmm. And so then, legislatively, superior courts were created. Okay. And so what you'll find then in every county is there may be one or more superior courts. Okay. And that's based upon population. Gotcha. So whereas we have one, mm -hmm. you go up to Kosciuszko County, where Warsaw is located, mm -hmm. and they have two superior courts, and they just got legislatively approved for a third superior court, which will be coming on gotcha. next year. Again, based on population. Based upon population. Okay. Now, you go down to Indianapolis, my goodness, I think they have like 25. Mm -hmm. And then you really, then you have superior courts down there that they are just doing a particular practice area. Oh, I see. Like yeah. a drug court, maybe, or a exactly. this or that, yep. divorce. Oh, interesting. Because there's so much, so many cases. Gotcha. So you, we all, ha every county has a circuit. Most counties are going to have at least one superior, maybe okay. more based upon population. Great. And then, and that's a question I get asked a lot is, you know, well, what kind of cases you're going to yeah. hear if you're yeah. elected superior court judge? Well, both courts are courts of what's called general jurisdiction. And what that means is both courts can hear all criminal cases, can hear all civil cases. Okay. But then once you find out they're, few legislative differences on that. But I mean, then what you'll find out is that within each county, you know, they may distribute the certain practice areas in the court. For example, here in circuit court, uh, they, Judge Lee does all the probate matters. Okay. You know, so if you have a family member that mm -hmm. dies and you open up an estate, that goes into the circuit court. Okay. Uh, probate also includes guardianship. So if you had a family okay. member that, um, no longer has the capacity to make decisions, you need a guardianship, that would go in the probate court, that would go into circuit court here. Interesting, okay. Um, our circuit court also handles all the child in need of services cases, mm -hmm. you know, the abuse and neglect cases that the D uh, Division of Family and Children get involved in. And then down in superior court, um, 
what's designated for Superior Court, it would be all the traffic violations, okay. all the small claims, and then both courts share criminal cases. I see. The big difference with that is that Superior Court is going to get all the misdemeanors. And keep I see. in mind, misdemeanors are those crimes that the most you could serve in jail would be one year or less. Okay. Those are misdemeanors. Okay. Uh, the felonies get divided up between the two courts. They alternate. I see. And felonies are those crimes that where you could be in prison mm -hmm. for a year or more. Okay. So that's the difference between a misdemeanor and a felony. And the way that alternates is, is like in week one, if a crime is committed, that would go to circuit court. Week two, if it's a felony, mm -hmm. that would go to superior court. I see. And it just rotates that way. So what you find with that kind of uh, distribution of cases, the superior court case gets has the majority of the of the criminal cases right. in the county, because a lot of our cases are misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, we talked about this in, in the spring. Um, we don't have a lot of major felonies. Right. We do have them. Yeah. But we don't have a lot of them. Right. Most of ours tend to be misdemeanors or lower level felonies. And we cases. like it that way. We want to keep it that way, <laughs> and we need to be working to keep yeah, it that yeah, way. Yeah, we need that's to the thing. work to keep those misdemeanors down at some point, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Okay, so that's very interesting. So just because of the way that Fulton County and the state of Indiana have structured things, and then Fulton County put its, its two cents in there, the Superior Court in Fulton County is going to end up seeing a majority of the criminal cases. Under Absolutely. The very yep. good. Very good. Well, interesting stuff there. Now... What do you see that you might want to do differently? What do you see that's really good that just needs some more facilitation? Where? What are your thoughts about where you want to take things? Well, I'll answer that in, in two parts. Mm -hmm. One, I think there is a misconception out there about there's certain uh, sensing alternatives that are not available in Fulton County. Okay. Such as uh, home detention. Mm -hmm. Such as work release. Now that's house arrest, right? Exactly. And you're saying well, that... home detention is house arrest. Okay. Work release is where you would be placed in jail, but then you're released to go work and gotcha. then come back to jail. Then come back when you're done. Exactly. Gotcha. Um, and we do have those things going on in Fulton County. Okay. I think there's a misconception that we don't have community corrections. Community corrections, understand, is an alternative form of sentencing. Yes for uh, DOC sentences, right. Department of Correction sentences. We do have that. So I want to clear up that misconception. Okay, good to know. Uh, the other misconception, I think, is that we're not receiving, the county is not receiving state funding mm -hmm. for some of these services mm -hmm. or these programs. And the Fulton County is okay. receiving those. There's different funding sources, mm -hmm. um, and Fulton County does receive those funding sources. Okay. So I want to clear up those misconceptions. Good to know. Um, then, as far as like what I would like to do, and this touches upon what we discussed in the spring, mm -hmm. but it bears repeating, is that who, anybody that comes into court mm -hmm. is coming in, obviously, with a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's, you know, be it a civil problem, mm -hmm. a family law problem, mm -hmm. or a criminal law problem. If we're focusing on just the criminal law problem, mm -hmm. it's important to, first of all, know what the law is, have enough experience with that, sure. know what the facts are, understand what the offense is that the person is charged with. And then I think it's important also, well, what is the problem behind this person that has gotten them into this sure. court? Right. And that's where I'd like to try to make more of a difference. Don't, because just, don't to, just put a Band-Aid on the, on the cut, look to see what caused the cut. Exactly right. Okay. That's a great analogy. Uh, but yeah, because what we see in the criminal justice system is repeat offenders. Yep. Recidivism. Okay. It, recidivism. Mm -hmm. That's every Word of the day. Exactly. <laughs> it's just repeat offenders mm -hmm. committing the, having this, committing the same crimes yep. because they have the same underlying problem. Right. And so if we're going to address that, right. the repeat offender we got to get to the underlying problem. That's where I want to get to. Gotcha. Um, and then, as part of that, one thing we do not have, but it's in the works, mm -hmm. is to start a drug court. Okay. Um, and because drug court, and I guess I need to explain at least what drug sure, court is, please. because there's a lot of mis misconception about that, too. I attended drug court up in Kosciuszko County. Okay. It's run by Judge, Judge Reed. And... 
this is not like for the first time offender. Mm -hmm. This is for the person that we're just talked about okay. coming back into the system yep. over and over and yep. over again. Now they are at the point where they're going to face a very long prison sentence mm -hmm. in the Department of Correction, the state penal, penal system. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of doing that, we're going to give you this opportunity. You'll come in, you're going to You'll have a plea agreement. You'll mm -hmm. plead guilty to these charges. But then we're going to put you in drug court. And now this is going to be intense. Intensive services, mm -hmm. intensive scrutiny, mm -hmm. intensive court interaction. Mm -hmm. Because you're going to be working. You're going to be reporting every week to you know a probation officer yeah. or a community corrections officer. You're going to be randomly drug screened. Mm -hmm. that, that's, you know, that's the problem. Right. And then you're going to be meeting with the judge every week. There's going to be a court every week, wow. and you're going to be one-on-one -on -one with the judge. And before that court hearing, that judge is going to sit down with the service providers, mm -hmm. you know, people who are providing the counseling, um, and find out, how is this person doing? Mm -hmm. And then that judge is going to have a one-on-one -on -one with that wow. person and say, look, you're doing great, or this is where you need to be working on, right. or you're getting very close to... Yeah, blowing this chance. Putting it's putting the ball back in the court of the judge, but w where he literally gets to make the decision on how you are proceeding. Absolutely, you are progressing well. The mm -hmm. reports are good, or hey, you're not giving an effort here. It's obvious. I'm going to give you one last chance. Exactly. I think that's, that's parenting to us. That's parenting to a large degree, is it not? Well, it is. <laughs> now we go off. Yeah. We can go. Back to where yeah. I believe that the, the breakup core of, of families, the problem, right? yeah, the breakup mm -hmm. of the families is a large part of this. Yeah. But what I notice when I observe that is the effectiveness mm -hmm. is that one-on-one -on -one yep. between the judge and and the and the defendant, yep. the client, um, the person. Yes. Because um, what I saw, those people were wanting to make good, mm -hmm. and I think it's because. You could tell Judge Reed up there. Mm -hmm. He took an interest. I See. mean, it's probably the first time that these people have felt that, yeah. wow, somebody really is wanting to give me that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just a system. Sure. Um, and I want to make good on this. Yeah. And I think that's the key to drug court. Yeah. But sometimes I think people hear drug court and they go, oh, well, you're just hand holding, you know, these people that have made a choice. Yeah. But it isn't because the first time drug offenders, that's what probation is for. Sure. We put you on probation, yeah. we give you services, and hopefully most people get through that and we don't see them again. But yeah. we do see a lot of repeaters and this is what drug court is for. Yeah, now um, I, I love the concept and of course, you know, to me it, it's logical. The more intense we um, are involved in this one particular individual's life and their rehabilitation, the higher our success rate will be with those individuals. Absolutely. Talk about cost a little bit. Is it that much more expensive? Well, yes and no. Okay. I mean, with, what's what's with, what's the cost of a human life, right? We we don't need to get metaphysical, well, but and I see it. With drug court and you know, with community corrections, mm -hmm. you know, there's there's grants that fund those. I see. Now, you can take the conservative, you know, and a cynical view that, um, well, we're paying for that. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are. But how much are we paying on the back end of things? Exactly. How much to put a criminal in prison for 20 right. years? We get we're it. paying one way or the one other. One way or the other. Now we're paying to try to be proactive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and the thing that you and I talked about in the spring, um, if I end up being that judge that's on drug court, mm -hmm. and that's not to say that even if I get elected, I'm going to be, it could be Chris Judge Lee. Sure. But um, I look at it, if we, if we have... I don't care if we have 20 people in there. If we mm -hmm. have two true successes mm -hmm. that where we are breaking that generational mm -hmm. cycle and they've got kids that are going to look at them and say, wow, yep. mom, dad had a problem, but they worked through it. And I can, you know, yeah. that's a success. I and agree. that's what we need. We I need agree. to start somewhere. Yeah. And I think your rate of return, quite frankly, is, is beyond the success of, oh, we rehabilitated somebody and put them back into the community. But it's, that person is now a contributing member of community. This, they may end up being a teacher or a doctor or mm -hmm. a lawyer or running a business here locally and paying taxes and property taxes and income taxes and being a part of the community. Absolutely, so, we all benefit then. Yeah. Then the money spent for that, how does that come back and pay exactly. in? Exactly. 
you know, dividends then. Yeah, for years to come. So a really neat perspective there. Again, uh, Scott Sager here. We've got Greg Heller in the studio today. He's running for Superior Court Judge on the Republican ticket, correct? On the Republican ticket, yeah. Okay. Um, anything else you want to tell the folks today, Greg? It's kind of your opportunity here to talk well, to them. Well, yes, because, you know, I wanted to kind of bring everybody up to speed on mm -hmm. since you and I talked in the spring. Yeah. The other thing that, um, that I, I attended an opioid summit down yeah. in Indianapolis, yeah. and that was uh, actually organized by our Supreme Court Justice, Loretta Rush. That's great. Every county was represented. And that was to deal specifically with the opi opioid problem yeah. that our county has, yeah. every county in Indiana has, throughout the nation we it's, have. Yeah, epidemic proportions Right, at this point. people are dying. Yeah. But keep in mind, really, if you're going to put the hierarchy of the drug problem here in Fulton County, uh -huh. meth is still prob is number really? one, and then heroin. We did a great job of legislating out of existence, well, virtually out of existence, meth labs, people yeah. that were manufacturing their own meth. Yeah. Start at the local level here, Val Pemberton mm -hmm. and Harry Webb, mm -hmm. um, with the ordinance that uh, Rick Brown and my and I helped put together nice. for local, locally, and then that got carried by Randy Head to yeah. the state level yeah. legislative, and then there's a state law. Yeah. So the good news is we don't have those meth labs. Great. But the bad news is now we've got meth coming up from Mexico, okay. the cartels. Yep. Um, so meth is still a huge problem. Now, with heroin, that's the that's what's really killing people really? because they're releasing it with phenytoin, and and you see it in the paper, and you know police saving people's lives with the use of Narcan. Yeah. And there's a lot of debate about the, about that, but. This summit was organized to, to basically say, look, we got a huge yeah. epidemic problem here. Right. We got to start addressing it. And the summit, and I learned some things from this, was first of all, the first part of it was all by, uh, by doctors. Okay. About how the best treatment for somebody that is addicted to really? opioids. And the best course of practice seems to be medical assisted treatment with the threat of coercion, meaning that addicts aren't going to seek help on their own. Mm -hmm. You've almost got to have the threat of incarceration, okay. but then you've got to medically treat them. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of um, controversy about that because you've heard of methadone clinics. Right. And people say, well, you're substituting one drug for another. Mm -hmm. Well, now there, there's a, a, a drug called... Uh, Viteral, mm -hmm. I think if I'm pronouncing that right, Viteral, that doesn't give the, the the high effect, gotcha, but does take away the craving effect, gotcha. Um, so essentially, by by med, by using a medic, uh, medicine to do this, we are weaning them off of it. Absolutely, is that what, what's happening? Exactly. Okay. Instead of a cold turkey, wean them down. That's going to have a more successful. Yep. And yeah. that takes a long time. Yeah. It's not immediate. Right. I mean, it take, could take years. It's not years. today and tomorrow. It's right. months. And see, and so that word, like the drug court, kind of, all these things kind of kind of play in they together. Do. Because if you've got that person and they, you've got the threat of this a long period of incarceration, yeah. I'm going to put you on drug court. Part of this is going to, you're going to be on the Viteral program. Mm -hmm. So it takes away your cravings. Hmm. That's you got to attack these this problem on a multi-front level. Yeah. And that's what this program that's was amazing. about this opioid. It was a full day program. And then the other thing I learned was um, we actually have Viteral being used at Fort County Counseling Center. Really? Um, so that is in play okay. right now. Nice. Um, ball's and, already rolling, so to the speak. The ball's rolling. Mm -hmm. I mean, now there's more that can be done mm -hmm. to, to expand the use of this. And I said, like I said, it's kind of somewhat controversial. Yeah. I mean, some people don't agree with the idea of the medical assisted treatment, but right. it seems to be that's the be best practice yeah. at this point. That's the one that matters to me. Is right. What's going to take this person from point A to point B the quickest and most effective? Absolutely. So, hmm. um, so those are things I've done since we've talked that's in excellent. the spring. And we uh, talked a little bit about hope here in Fulton County. Talk about that. I did. We talked about that off camera. That's the other thing I've been doing. I've been trying to reach out to some local groups here see what what they're doing 
because as we talked about in the spring, mm -hmm. if we're going to, it's going to be a community effort right. to, to address yeah. substance abuse. Yeah. Because the question gets asked, well, how do we keep our kids from even using it? Well, right. that's a multi-layered question right. with multi-layered answers. Absolutely. And so as a community, we've got to come together and we've got to try to address that. Hope is an organization, a volunteer organization, and I love their concept yeah. because it fits in what you and I talked about in the spring because they've got three committees. I mean, they've got for substance abuse and mental health, okay. for poverty and youth and family. Yep. And, you know, we're talking about family breakups. Mm -hmm. You're talking about generational poverty. Mm -hmm. You're talking about, you know, mental health leading in, to substance abuse. A lot of the things that fill our courtrooms, it right? It does. It fills the courtroom, and they all, they, they somewhat... Interlock, yeah, they do dovetail lace. for sure. And so it's just starting up, but I mean, I've attended a couple of their meetings Great. because I think that that's, I think those are groups and programs we need to support yeah. because that's, that's They're addressing the right today's idea. problem, the practical problem, and they're trying to dig in there. And uh, we haven't yet had them in here. Uh, folks from Hope, we want to get you in here and uh, talk about the great things you're doing, give you some promotion here on RTC TV4. But I'm glad to hear that you're addressing it. I think what impressed me the most from what you just said, Greg, was that someone within the judicial system came out and said, we've got to talk as a consortium and as colleagues about this opioid problem because exactly it's, it it's not just a police have to deal with it. It's not just the schools. It's not just the communities. It is here in our laps now, yep. and we need to address it from the top layer we down, so that's do. fantastic. Um, and again, you know, that kind of, we talked about off camera is, you know, I'm reading this book called Dope Sick, mm -hmm. that kind of traces the yeah. opioid uh, epidemic that we have right now. Mm -hmm. This is not a new thing. No, I we mean, talked about the snake back. oil salesman back in the day. Yep, and, I mean, it's yep. not new. Yep. And so, you know, at some point, we got to start doing things different. Sure. we got to look at things different. Absolutely. If we're, if we're going to do anything positive. Yeah. And as we talked about in the spring, you know, once the, the people come into court mm -hmm. and we're the criminal justice level up here, mm -hmm. well, there's things we can be doing more of. Sure. Absolutely. I want to do more alternative sentences. More, you know, I want to do more home detention that fits the crime, fits the person. Sure. Work release that fits the crime, fits the person. We want to do all those things. But boy, we also got to be working down here, mm -hmm. so they're not getting up here. Yeah, and that's that's the difficulty is to get all these people and all these organizations and you out there working with he and there and her there and bringing yep. them all together. And I've seen a lot of those great things happening in Fulton County over the past uh, 10, 15 years that I've been back. Um, and so I look forward to, uh, every November to see what's going to come out on the other end. I look forward to see how once the elected officials are all put in place, how they begin to gel as a group. Um, I think it ebbs and flows. You get some good fits. You get some fits mm -hmm. that don't. But, um, again, this is up to you, and that's why we bring the candidates in here so that you get to hear them in their own words. Yep. I don't provide a whole lot of grilling questions. This is just an opportunity to get to know you a little bit. Again, Greg Heller here. He'll be on your ballot um, on the Republican ticket for Superior Court Judge here in Fulton County. Had to go in my memory I know. there for a second. <laughs> I think you are my 10th interview uh, this political season, and it's been great. We've enjoyed it. I know you do. You've been sending me texts and emails, so I can't thank you That's enough for coming in. a great service to provide. Busy man trying to get in here, but I appreciate you making the time for me. Well, I'm glad that you had me, and yeah. uh, I will tell your viewers that if you have any questions mm -hmm. about my, me or what I want to do, please call the office. Yeah. I mean, 223-4000, okay. very easy number. Yeah. Um, Listen to my radio program. Mm -hmm. It's every Friday at 8.15 on WROI. Okay, that's 92.1. Um, We've had a series of uh, programs the last few months. We brought in, like, from uh, from the probation department. We've had in Todd Hutkins, who nice. runs the drug and alcohol. We've had Andy Holland, who runs community corrections, also the chief, also the chief uh, uh Andy Schaff. Probation officer. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then we've had Kathy Collins to talk about programming that's going on in the jail because there are things going on in the jail. Fantastic. Uh, last month we had uh, the CEO and the regional vice president of Four County to talk wow. about the programs that they are doing in the Great. medical assisted treatment programs. So listen to the program. You get a lot of information that way. I love it. Um, and refer back to the interview we did in the spring. Yeah, you can watch that on RTC4. That's probably a little account. bit more of my background then, but okay. today I wanted to talk some more meat and potatoes. Yeah, plus we got the girls' names in today's yeah, interview. Yeah, we got the, yeah, we, and, we and corrected that problem. We so. did. 
Well, Greg Heller again. Thanks, Greg. Thank you again for watching. And uh, November 6th coming up soon. So be sure and uh, be sure you're registered. That's by the 9th. That's actually That's tomorrow. 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 So yep. tomorrow for us, maybe not tomorrow for you as you're looking at this, but uh, be sure that you're out there on Election Day. And I should say that if you're interested in volunteering, um, as a poll monitor or anything, please contact one of the uh, party chairs, Phyllis Bittinger, of course, on the Democratic side. The Republican is Mike Canada. Mike Canada. You can get a hold of Mike. And uh, again, they're looking for volunteers to help at the polls. So uh, until they next time. <laughs> yeah, they always are. Until next time, I'm Scott Sager here on RTC TV4. Hey.